<laughs> How are we all doing? Good. We're all over here today. Hi. <laughs> uh, you matter too. Don't worry. Don't worry. You're, you're fine, Courtney. Um, so uh, last week we started a series called Into the Taboo, and we kind of laid a foundation of how kind of things were in creation, how things were uh, in, in creation before the fall, before things kind of turned to chaos. Um, you, you recognize that? We're reading through the creation account. We're like, man, that sounds pretty good. Minus the whole vegetarian thing. That, that right. didn't sound too good. Um, but it just overall, it's like, man, this sounds good. But then we're introduced to this, this, this person in the story of the serpent who comes in and asks a question of Eve that is a question that derails every single person in this room. And that question that he asks is, did the Lord really say? Did the Lord really say? And at that moment, in that question, the authority of who God is begins to be questioned in the, in the hearts and minds of humanity. And now it led to the fall and led to, just, led to sin in the world, behavioral, uh, environmental, all the things you can imagine. And it's just, it's just chaos now. And this is where you and I get to live. And now we have topics in our churches and in our families and our community that we just prefer not to talk about because it causes too much controversy or causes too much uh, shaming or guilt or, or just we prefer just to, you know, smile and believe everything's fine and just love Jesus, praise the Lord, and we'll just keep moving. Um, but that's not what God's asked us to do because meanwhile, as the church, as Christians, we're not having conversations that the rest of the world is having. And if we believe that Jesus is the hope and the future of humanity, uh, we, we, we should have a general idea of <laughs> what the Bible says about these certain topics. So uh, we jumped into it last week, and I, I understand uh, a lot of these, uh, these sermons, these 30-minute conversations, this is purely designed to begin conversation. It's to really begin to go, okay, hey, have you thought about this? Are you talking with your family, talking with friends, talking with people at work, going, hey, have you ever thought about this? What, what do you think about these topics? And not going in with just um, uh, thoughts and opinions, but seeing what the Word of God actually says. And so one of the things that we've, we've done, because I understand nothing that we talk about is going to be exhaustive. I cannot cover every single thing you've ever wanted to know about doubt or sexuality in a 30-minute conversation. Believe me. I will let you down and I will fail. Um, but what we've done is we've provided some resources in the cafe for you that you can purchase at a discounted rate. We're not making any money off it. We bought it on Amazon for $12. We're selling it to you for $10. Um, but just a way to help resource you if there's a specific topic that you're really interested in. So there's a bookmark uh, kind of in your, um, in your bulletin that gives a list of all the topics that we're going to be discussing and the dates and uh, the uh, kind of information about the resource center. So all of that is in there is we, um, we realize that we want to grow. We want to change. We want to look more like Jesus. And I understand a lot of these topics are already hitting some nerves. Uh, I've already had a few people go, up, hey, I'm kind of nervous to come to church on this Sunday because I don't know what's going to be said. That's the Sunday you want to be here. So if there's a topic that you're like, this, I, I don't know, I don't want to talk about it, that's the time that you want to be here because when we're uncomfortable, God is able to move in a, in a greater way in you when you are comfortable. So be here, um, be a part of that. I'm extremely excited. The mental health one we're bringing in. Uh, one of my dear friends who's a psychologist and pastor uh, who's going to be speaking on mental health, and she, this is her, her passion, this is her life's work. And so really excited for that in, in August. Um, but just be really, be ready, because our desire is to look more like Jesus. So there has to be that, that willingness to, to grow and to change. And so it'll be fun. But just like last week, we set down some ground rules, um, because I have no problem turning this car around and going home. Um, <laughs> if we start misbehaving and not treating each other with love and respect. So a couple <laughs> of ground rules uh, to kind of ask yourselves in your conversations, whether with family here in the church, so we're not having brawls in the courtyard. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, wait for it to be a fundraiser event, then maybe we can do like an MMA thing. I don't know. Um, rule number one is, are we, uh, ground rule number one is, uh, are we being loving? Uh, second one is, are we trusting God in this? Are you willing to come to an answer that you don't like or you don't understand and still trust God? Um, because it's a process. There's a reason why you go to school for 12 plus years, because many of you are um, trying to answer an algebra question with addition knowledge. And sometimes you've got to wait. You've got to mature 
and grow and develop before you get an answer. So just are you trusting God in the midst of that? And then are you choosing wisdom or are you going to choose to be foolish? Uh, the goal is to choose, choose wisdom with that. So this is a situation you and I find ourselves in. If you're in this room, you either have come to know Christ or at least you're interested in this thing called Jesus um, and possibly the church or maybe your mom made you come. Um, either way, it's a good thing you're here. In this pursuit to follow Jesus and to live the way that he lived, we're in constant contrast to the way that the world around us is living. And many of us, you, you probably lived in that world. You've experienced those things. You've, 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 you've tasted that. And so there's a pull sometimes going, okay, I want to follow Jesus, but I really like doing these other things. I really like not caring about anybody else and just taking care of me. Or I really like partying until I pass out Friday nights. So That's just my thing. You know, like there's just some things that you, you're like, I really like this, but Jesus is saying, I need to follow this way. And this is why I do feel life. But every once in a while I get tired, I get frustrated, so I want to go back to this. And, and then the, you turn on the news and you turn on just the, what, what's trending and what's popular and what's, what's, um, what's kind of the thing now. You're like, ah, do, I, do I pull to that because it's socially acceptable or do I hold, hold firm to the truths of God? And we, I don't even know what the truths of God. So how do I know how to distinguish between what I'm supposed to do? And uh, anyone else find themselves in that poll, left and right? Anyone? Just me? Yeah, it, it's, if we're honest with ourselves, we need to be very aware of that. Because the last thing we ever want to do is put things in a corner, hide them behind, you know, sweep them underneath the rug. Because what happens is these real issues are things that people are talking about. More importantly, are, are, are wrestling with. And when we hide things, what we do is we start saying that that's shameful. And what happens when people are in shame and guilt, they don't find freedom. Because shame and guilt are things from the enemy. Now, when we start practicing love and conversation and, and, and uh, community, well, then those things that once were shameful can come into light. When things come into light, that you can get healed. And that's hopefully our goal as a church, is we want to see people healed, not shamed in a corner. We want to see people gain healing. And so we face this reality of the gospel and culture. How do we move forward knowing we want to be faithful with Jesus, but we don't want to offend people, or we don't want to be different in, than anybody else around us? We just want to be normal. We don't want to be weird. Um, I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever, um, maybe I just struggle with this sometimes. I'll turn to life, I'll like look on YouTube or uh, maybe there's a, teacher, uh, a TV preacher on or something like that. And I get embarrassed. And I'm like, do I look and sound like that? Because that's embarrassing. Like you're like, but you're a pastor. I said, yeah, just, just turn on TV in. And you'll find a lot of things like, oh my gosh. Like, if you have, I don't know what your profession is like. Maybe you're a plumber. You go in and you see someone else's plumbing job. You're like, why do they use that pipe? Why did they? Oh, my gosh. This is embarrassing. Like, anyone else ever feel like that? Like, you're, like, embarrassed for your own profession sometimes? Um, or just, like, it's just, like, your kids do something. You're like, oh, my gosh, I'm not their dad. Like, oh, my goodness. You love them, but you're like, oh, man. And so there's this, this pull. And so the gospel itself, we have to be aware of, it is offensive, and that's where um, our goal shouldn't be as Christians, so we don't want to offend anybody. Because if that's your goal, you're in the wrong faith. Um, because there's a reason why the, our, our person that we look to in our faith is Jesus. And the reason why he was crucified on the cross, not because he, was a, he committed a crime, but because he offended a lot of people. The gospel itself is offensive. It confronts people with complete honesty. The gospel is the true mirror. There's no, there's no hiding. What you're looking at is what you are. There's, there's, no, there's no filter on that. At its first hearing, it does not take account of your story or your background or all that you may have overcome and all that you have accomplished in your life. It doesn't care about that. It confronts you for who you are. It speaks to your very soul. And in Luke chapter 4, uh, you can turn there and uh, we're going to look at verse 16 through 21. And we're going to come to a place where Jesus is beginning his ministry. He's, been, he's at synagogue. He's a faithful Jewish believer. Uh, he, he's, he's at synagogue. He's, he's been asked to read a, a scroll, a passage of scripture. And so this is kind of where we pick up the story here. It says, now Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And he, um, as was his custom, went to synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. He starts reading this place, uh, this passage in Isaiah. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down, and the eye of all in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. And he began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He is saying, I am bringing the gospel. I am bringing the good news. I am the one who's going to set captives free. I am the one who's bringing the Lord's year of his favor. But it's not just a year every seven years anymore. The Lord's favor is going to be an age of grace. The age of the Lord's favor is now. This is the gospel message. And we read it, we go, that's awesome, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. But let's look at it. So I have this little chart up here. It's a little, it's a little raw. Um, but go ahead and throw it up there. Okay, well, it got better than first service. Great. Um, last service, we just screenshot it because, yeah, I just didn't get in there. See, the gospel says that God has authority. It, it says that right there in Luke 18, the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Well, our culture says, well, I'm my own authority. So you have a problem right away, right? Because have anyone, you know, someone tells you what to do. How many of you love to be told what to do? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure, Anthony. Um, and so <laughs> what happens when someone comes and tells you what to do, what your, our normal response usually is, who do you think you are? <laughs> By what authority do you speaketh of? <laughs> who are you? Now, if they flash a badge, you're like, yes, sir. You know, like, instantly something changed. You know, you find out, you know, you're a kid and your parent walks in the room suddenly like you're the best angel child. Like, because the authorities change. But when we have, in our culture, we think that you are our own authority. You have the right to do whatever you want with your body, with whatever you, you that's you. You're right. Well, then it goes on that the gospel says that he's here by God's authority to set free of the poor, the captive, and the oppressed. Our culture and our just humanity says well, I'm wealthy, I'm in control, it's my choice, and I'm in denial of anything else. This is why we ask people, hey, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm in control. Everything's perfect. And then if you're a Christian, you just dress it up a little bit. I'm blessed. <laughs> God is good. Haven't talked to him in a week, but God is good. Oh. And so it's just this like, like, I'm in complete control. I'm not poor. I'm not oppressed. I'm not held captive by anything. I can stop any time. Well, the gospel says you're captive. And it says the Lord's favor. And we don't like this one because we are constantly seeking after other people's favor. Very, in, in our culture, in our humanity, you and I, for the, if we we're honest with ourselves, you're not that concerned about the Lord's favor. You want to know if people like you, if they accept you, if they're going to love you. So you hide and you put things on to make sure people receive you well. And so the gospel is offensive because it says it's his, his authority, not yours. You, you are damaged. You need rescuing. I've got it all figured out. The Lord's favor is enough for you that you're creating his image and his likeness. No, I need other people to like me. Anyone offended by the gospel yet? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> But this is the contrast that you and I live in because our current culture, it celebrates self. It celebrates, you know, I love this. Do you have any regrets in life? No regrets. Glad I did it all. Really? Because I've seen your decisions. And I would regret them. Regrets aren't a bad thing. Anyways, no regrets, no regrets. That's where I got you where you are. Are you really? Because you don't seem very happy where you are. Anyway, another conversation. There's no accountability, but yet we want all the authority. For something wrong, it needs, if there's something wrong with us, that's offensive because we have it all together. We carry an arrogance about our humanity. See, what happens, we end up, we change the definition of right so we're never wrong. It's early, and I've discovered this, it's playing a game with a six-year-old. They're constantly changing the rules of the game. You have, if we're going to play hide and go seek, you have to hide here. Then what's the point of hide and go seek? Well, that way I can find you. You're missing the point. I don't care. That's how I want to play. Sinful. <laughs> but the problem is, if you've discovered in life, if you haven't, you will. Often the best, the, the hardest things in life are doing the right things. That's not easy. But being in a culture and society where we've grown up with, where we avoid the hard, 
We do everything in our power to avoid pain. And so when pain and hard things happen, we do everything we can to numb it in order to not have to do it. And that's why you're never being able to do the right thing. Because it's hard work. And we've grown up to medicate it and to, uh, to just get rid of it. God does so much growth through pain and suffering. But our culture values some easy convenience and not really not doing the right thing. Technology isn't, isn't growing and expanding to make uh, humanity a better place. You know that, right? It, technology is expanding to make your life easier. Like that's all. It has nothing to do with the betterment of humanity. <laughs> it's just to appease the consumer so they purchase more. <laughs> We're aware of that, right? Like people aren't that righteous as that they think of. We, we as, as Care Corp care about you. No, they don't. They just want to make money off you. So if you care about something, they're going to care about. So they make another conversation. <laughs> so really, now the question is, how do Christians, how do the church, how are we supposed to deal with culture? Uh, so we're trying to follow Jesus, but at the same time, we've got this culture is trying to pull us into, you know, when the, when the fall happened, we were given, uh, before the fall, we had the knowledge of good. We ate of the tree of good and evil. Now we know good and evil. And so now we live this good and evil. Uh, as Christians, we're trying to pursue the good, and yet the evil looks and tastes so good. So there's this contrast. So what do we do? So it's kind of three thoughts, school of thoughts on this. And we're going to go through this real quick, then we'll get to the application points. But the first one is we can avoid culture altogether. Uh, we could reflect the culture, or we can transform culture. So when we avoid culture altogether, this is when we retreat into the woods, we build up walls, we create a village and a commune to keep everybody else out, we create an ark uh, to protect ourselves. And so that's, you know, and there's kind of negative examples that, of that we've seen. Uh, we do this when we make the church all about the people who are currently inside and not care about the people outside, um, where we're more concerned about just keeping how things are instead of making changes in order to reach more people. Um, we shelter our kids from the real world. Now, I understand there are developmental things that don't, don't, don't try to explain to your two-year-old what murder is. Um, or, you know, those things, there's certain things that developmentally you, you, you bring, but you don't shelter it from them. You don't keep them from the rest of the world. They graduate and go crazy. Um, <laughs> some of you are in here because you did that, and it's, it was a crazy 10 years of your 20s. There's uh, creating community, uh, communities with no accountability, no prote protection. This is how cults start. When they say, I don't need to submit to any authority, we're going to go separate ourselves from, from, from normal, cult, normal community and culture, and we are going to um, just do our own thing. That's how you get crazy things where incest starts becoming a thing, uh, rape starts becoming a thing, uh, money laundering, and then suddenly you're drinking Kool-Aid on a Saturday night and not realize why you're not waking up Sunday morning. Um, it's just this is really unhealthy things. It's when you detach yourself from a hurting world, imagine it's, it's like a doctor saying, I'm not going to take care of the sick because I don't want to get sick. So I'm going to go hide. <laughs> Meanwhile, the world around is dying. That's, what happened. That's really a good idea of what the church is if we hide. Now, there have been seasons where God has withheld the church and, and you know during the dark ages and other times where monasteries became uh, a really popular way to really protect uh, scripture protect the uh, uh, christian traditions um, and those were seasons but they're just seasons you're not supposed to you're not supposed to stay there um, you know and i've seen people use scriptures like oh psalm one says that we are to avoid the counsel of the wicked that means you don't ask them for tax advice that means you don't ask them about relationship advice that doesn't mean you stop loving them you, you, you don't go after their counsel, but you continue to love them because they need Jesus just as much as anybody else. The other option is we can reflect culture. This is where we ch when we change the gospel in order to become more relevant or agreeable with the, the popular culture at large. Um, this is when, you, you know, <laughs> it's just a stupid idea. But um, it's when you, like, start changing your hair and you're dating a guy because that's the way he likes it. You know, he likes to like short hair, so you're gonna have short hair, long hair. He's like, you know, it's just like whatever, like the current temperatures. You're more of a a, therm uh, a thermometer than a thermostat. You're not setting it. You're just measuring what it is and rising to that level. And so, what happens is when we start expecting, uh, we start, you know, expecting. Um, no, I don't like that. Yeah, negative exa examples when we start reflecting the culture is when we think that Christian leadership should be in a government form. 
You know, this is where we got the terrible things in centuries like the Crusades, where people were doing governmental things like conquest, colonialism, and putting the Christian name on it. That's not Jesus. Jesus isn't saying go massacre people. But because they were trying to look like the culture, they put him in place. We have people who recant Jesus' authority in order to worship Caesar and God. Little g, God. They're condoning the mistreatment of women and children. There have been in, in other minorities and races where people were using Scripture to, to um, uh, justify their poor behavior and, and, and hurt people and destroy families. We see it that you know, teaching a filled, a fluffy prosperity gospel filled with butterflies and rainbows, just a feel-good message, um, negating that there is real suffering in life and that the, God uses suffering. We, it's just negative example, but there's been really good examples, like utilizing technology to share the gospel all around the world. Our founder of Foursquare, Amy Simple McPherson, she was the first woman who owned a radio station in the world, and she used that radio station to broadcast the gospel all around the country. That's, that's a good use of technology. Now, another great way is really how um, secular music brought Christian music back from the dead. Um, because there were a few centuries, there's centuries of Christian music being the forefront of the arts and the music community growing in, and with the beautiful stained glass and all these different things just um, creating this, this art culture. Well, then the, like the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s happened and Christian music just kind of went. <laughs> just bad. If you don't believe me, go home and YouTube uh, Jesus is a friend of mine. And you get an idea of what Christian music was like. I get it, the Jesus movement, I, I know there's, we all grow. But with the excellence of what we're starting to see in secular music started affecting the excellence that was happening in Christian music. So you get the, you know, old bands like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and all these different ones who really pushed the limit on music, brought Christian music to a whole new world of expression and worship uh, that we're seeing today. If you, there, worship music is 100 times better than it was 20 years ago. But, you know, the hymns and stuff were a, a central part. So it kind of went up and then went down and it's coming back up. So it's good things. Um, but to be able to see that that really helped the Christian culture. But to simply to reflect culture is really to withhold uh, hope, life, and truth. It's really letting someone walk around with their fly down all day long. <laughs> like, we love you, love you, love you, look awesome, but I don't want to offend you, so I'm not going to tell you your, your flies down. It's a windy day, bro. You got to do that, but come on. Like, <laughs> fix this, but I don't want to offend you. And you just let people walk around and just open and vulnerable. And... <laughs> but love and truth become a powerful combination that helps people get free. But so many times we want to love, love, love without the truth. And when we reflect culture, we're just loving everything without any truth. It becomes very, very difficult. The last idea that we can use is we, uh, in the Christians we um, relate to culture is we can transform culture. When we take the gospel and use it to bring God's kingdom to earth, the idea of, Lord, you're as in heaven as on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. The idea of, of that coming down, it's that it's, and I've shared this before, is if you don't know Jesus, your time on earth, this is the closest to heaven you're ever going to get. You're going to experience love, joy, peace, excitement, pleasure, food, you know, all the things are just like, man, it makes life great. But if you are a believer in Christ, earth is going to be the closest that you ever get to hell. It's the only place you're going to have to suffer, cry, and be betrayed. After death, man, you get to spend time in heaven. And so this, this meeting that happens, that we get to transform culture, that we get to introduce this to, to earth, where we can make earth a better place. And within the 21st century, um, it was Christians that built every hospital, that created them, built them, staffed them, funded them. It was by Christians who brought cures, health, and hygiene to the world. It was through the church that uh, they brought the first universities within the United States, and they educated generations. Music, science, and arts flourish as Christians thought ways to expand their worship. The very idea of loving your neighbor, treating people with respect, generosity, each person having value, caring for the marginalized, being faithful to your spouse, raising and educating children, taking care of, of your finances, are all their biblical principles. They're all biblical principles. These are things that, that, that God has purposely blessed our community, that Christians decide, hey, we're going we're gonna to celebrate these things in our culture. And that's why they're celebrating now. 
What you're not going to find is a culture that, that only recognizes that, that there is no creation, that we all became into being purely out of a happenstance explosion in space. And we just happen to be here. If, if that is your worldview, that's fine, that's great. However, there is no value to anything then. Because there's no moral value and there's no design, then why would you ever fight for equal rights? Why would you ever fight for equal pay? Why would you ever fight for, to take care of another human being? Because survival of the fittest. Your job is to be on top and not to value people. The more you value people, the more you love, the more uh, you're going down the totem pole. It's impossible to say that you have a moral authority without the authority. Because at the end of the day, it's just about you. And how your life is affecting you. So that's what we, our culture, they want the morals without moral authority. So the morals constantly change because they don't have an authority. But this is, as a church, Jesus tells us this in Matthew 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if its salt has lost its taste, how shall the saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put, in under, put it under a basket or a stand. It gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our role as a church, our role as Christians, is not to merely reflect it, not to run away from it, but to transform it. Because people need Jesus. People need the healing and the rescuing that comes from him. They need the gospel. So number one, write this down. We must see the world around us for what it is and what it needs. The world, we want to see the world around us for what it is and what it needs. We have a world that is full of people who are lost, orphaned, scared, blind, and oppressed. They need Jesus. It, it, it changes our understanding when we recognize that they aren't the problem. They are a result of the problem. How many of you guys seen Lion King, either the animated one or the new one? If anyone has not seen it, spoiler alert, you're 20 years late. Just so you know. So I have a question for you. Technically, who killed Mufasa? Wow. <laughs> who kills Mufasa? I, I, I hear Scar. I didn't technically see him kill Mufasa. The wildebeest. The wildebeest killed Mufasa. Since chills down you, doesn't he? Um, <laughs> sit again. So the wildebeest kills Mufasa, but who's the bad guy in the movie? Scar's the bad guy in the movie. So how does Scar, being the bad guy in the movie, equate into the wildebeest killing Mufasa? Who excited the wildebeest? To go start doing, going down the cavern and doing the, the stampede thing. Nah, the hyenas. The little demons. All right? The little demon hyenas and a little laugh, a little cackle. Okay? But who incited the hyenas? Scar. So, with Mufasa falling down, and you got the whole, like, uh, you know, Scar comes down and, like, clamps down on, on Mufasa's hands. And I forget, he says all, like, uh, what does he say? Long live the king goes, rah. You know, like, that's my lion impression. Just like that. Claws down. He goes, long live the king. And Mufasa goes, no. And the wildebeest take him out. So the question, in that scenario, who are you mad at? But the wildebeest killed him. So let me ask you this question. Why are you hurt and upset when people break your heart? When it's the enemy who's inciting them to do it. Why is it the, the people that you, you speak so poorly of, the people that you hate, the people that you make sure that you know that they are not in relationship with you, you purposely hurt them, but in the meantime, it wasn't them. It's the enemy who incited them. Do you, can you believe that people are not the enemy, but the enemy's the enemy? 
The wildebeest are not the villains of Lion King. Scar is. But so many times we are holding people. Now, they should be held accountable for their actions. Okay? I have a whole conversation I want with the wildebeest. Stop. It's your king. Anyway. Um, but why are we so focus on hurting people when it's the enemy that is causing the pain and the hurt and the frustration. See, when, if we have I, I, our idea in our culture within the church that people are the problem, we will never go out to rescue them because people are not the problem, they're the mission. Right. They're the ones who are hurting, who are needing Jesus, who are needing the rescuing of the gospel. And it's this, this crazy thing that, that bursts in us as believers when we recognize that we are no longer slaves, but now we are children of God. We have hope not only hope for me, but hope for humanity. And so when I look out to a group of people who are hurting, who are broken, who are betraying, who are, or who are just making really poor decisions, I don't see destruction. I don't see them as the enemy. I see hope because I know Jesus saves lives. I know Jesus rescues souls. So we begin to see hope. And when we live, to begin, when we live in a world where there's hope, we find things that, are, that were once impossible that become possible. As Christians, our hope is Jesus, crucified, resurrected from the dead. Just as you and I are going to face death, we are going to face resurrection, and this is our hope. In, in Hebrews, the author says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for our soul, a hope that enters the place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. We have to have hope because that's what the world needs. So we cannot just look at the world as if it needs just, you know, just needs to be wiped out. No, we have the hope. We have the solution to the problem. But number two, write this down. We need to overcome the fear the world has adopted. We need to overcome the fear the world has adopted. We are most outside of our God's design when we're afraid. Because when we're afraid, what we do is we, um, we go in the attack mode. We're no longer here to serve, we're here to dominate. Because I'm afraid that I'm in danger. And so what happens, this is when you hear stories about movie theaters or in places when a fire happens um, and everyone dies in the theater. And they go and it's not, the fire didn't kill them, the smoke didn't kill them, the trampoline killed them. Because they're all going after the door, they just stepped all over each other. Because people start caring about the collective and only start caring about themselves. Because when fear is introduced, it turns into absolute chaos. We have such little regard for everybody else. But this is what's, so we do this with our words, our attitudes. Uh, when we get to an argument, when we start getting afraid that something's not good enough in us, we start getting self-aware and start getting insecure. We start going on attack. We start attacking people. That's why we call people names when we get into arguments. It's not because it's intellectually going to help you. It's just you're trying to emotionally get the upper hand. Um, and so you call them, you know, a doo-doo face. Um, <laughs> sorry, I watch six- and five-year-olds argue all day. Um, when we're in a conversation with someone who disagrees with you, you attack. When you see something on TV that makes you, uh, sets you off, you say hurtful things about people and co a community of people. They may not be in the room, but the problem is when you voice that, when you vocalize that, it does more damage to your soul than to anyone who could have ever heard you. Because, you're, again, you're classifying them as the enemy when they're not. They're God's greatest treasure. They're his, creating his image and his likeness. But this is what's neat about our God. This is his graciousness. God was able to turn what, God, what the enemy wanted for good, he turned it to good. Uh, wanted it for bad, he turned it to good. This is how now fear is, there's a healthy fear. Where there are times that we need to be afraid of things. Like, you know, don't go play in traffic. I'm afraid to get hit by a car. So that's a good thing that God now has used. Now, now that fear consumes me, and now I'm afraid of cars in general. And like going to a car dealership is like a nightmare. Uh, well, it is to begin with, but, you know, like just looking at a car, you start getting anxiety. Like that's when it starts overcoming. But there's a part where God can even use the things the enemy wanted to use to confuse humanity. He's able to use it for, his, for our good. So we are not any. We are no longer slaves. Now we have, we have, this, we have this hope. And so now because we, we have hope, we have courage to be able to face this culture that we're in. So number three, write this down. Hold tight to the truth of God's word. 
Our salvation comes through faith. We see it over and over again in Scripture. All you need is faith to come to know the Lord. But to really stay in relationship with the Lord, you need now you need understanding. Because everything in the world is going to come after you to pull you away from freedom and from truth. So we have to begin seeking understanding. Jesus goes from being your, your savior, now he becomes your teacher. You go from being rescued to now a student. And many of us stay in that part of where we still think we're in need of rescue. God's already rescued you. Now become a student of who Jesus is. So, so you can start living that out. But you know there's, there's, there's laws in our state to protect consumers? Uh, because everyone is out there to sell you something. Uh, and I kind of mentioned before, no one's out there to make humanity a better place. Everyone's out there to make, uh, make a buck. Well, we, are, we have a government out there that is set to help protect its citizens from such predators. Um, and so uh, every new car commercial tells you, hey, you get this new car and this person's going to like you. Um, or you wear this perfume and now you're desirable like Natalie Portman. Portman. Um, Portman. Um, <laughs> Uh, Aaron drives a Ford Flex, okay? It's, 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 a pretty, it's like a modern-day station wagon is what it is. But there was a commercial that came out when it first came out, and it was all these Ford Flexes parked in a park, parking lot, and it's all the cool moms that have a Ford Flex. They're just talking about all their cool things and how cool they are. And I remember seeing going, oh, my gosh, Aaron's a cool mom. She needs a Ford Flex. Not that she didn't need to become cooler because she's already cool. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, it was like, oh, okay. You know, and you start getting, like, dissatisfied with you. Or, like, medications that promise you everything. Um, but this, I, I've determined that medication commercials are the exact example of sin. Because this is what they do. They say, you know, they have some weird name, like something, Ia. Um, yeah. And it's always people, like, running outside and being happy and excited. You go, you take this medicine and your headaches will be gone. It's so good. They spend 20 minutes talking about how the headaches are going to be gone. And then they say, side effects may include. Okay? Your fingernails may come off. You may have violent diarrhea. You may lose all your friends. They will hate you, and your dog will die. But don't worry. Your headaches will be gone. And I love that because that's sin, right? Like, hey, this is going to feel so good. You're going to love it. It's a Saturday night. No one's watching. Who cares of the consequences? Sunday comes. Monday comes. You lose your job. You lose your wife. Your dog still dies. Um, <laughs> and, no, and you've lost your reputation. No one cares. You know, and you're like, wait, I thought this promised me the world. Yeah, side effects are always included. They're always worse than what you were trying to deal with to begin with. Just saying. But this is why California has these things called lemon laws. If you buy a used car and it turns out to be a, a bad car and it's, a, it's called a what? A lim- or you can call it a Ford. Either way, like it, it's okay. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It has a lemon law. So a certain amount of days you can go and take that car back without any, uh, any issues. Like you can go and exchange it for a new car. Not saying that they won't give you issues, but you know what I mean. They have a limit lot, but it's in order to protect people from consumer predators. The Bible is here to prepare us and protect us and to make us aware of the predators who are after your soul. Your soul is more valuable than a used car. That's why it's so important that we begin to understand who people are, who God is, who the enemy is, and how we can begin to reflect the love of Jesus to the world. Because God wants, has used you and I in order to be out there to protect and to lead people in the right direction. We must be able to discern and utilize this God's tool, his truth, for the things that he's purposed it for. I love it again in Hebrews. It says, the, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, of discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from the sight, but all are naked and exposed in the eyes of him who must give account what's amazing about his truth. You're not just reading words on the page, but it's reading your soul and your heart. It's the equivalent, I was thinking about this, um, imagine your life, and the good as you can do is you can take a, your, like a jack-o'-lantern, you've got a pumpkin and that little jagged knife they give you, and you're <laughs> supposed to do heart surgery on this pumpkin. You're just going, Rah! you know, just taking out, destroying the thing, it falls apart, it's like, oh. But that's what we do, but now compared to what God does, it's like a skilled hand surgeon. 
who has all the tools necessary, has everything ready, sanitary, ready to go, knows exactly where to ins insert the scalpel and exactly the incision that needs to be made in order to not damage everything else. Meanwhile, we're out there with a pumpkin carving knife and think we've got it figured out. <laughs> when we begin to trust the trusted surgeon who's able to divide between bone and marrow, God can begin to do the surgery on our hearts that is needed and not the damage that we think we can do on our own. Because his truth is good. So we have to embrace truth. You have to, make, you have to begin to decide to whether or not you're going to live designed to his word that's never changing or to the culture that's constantly changing. Where would you put your trust? Where do you put your hope? To be learned, to be led by a culture that is ever changing, whatever is popular. You know, I kind of wrote this in my notes, and I didn't mention it first service, but it, it was perfectly okay 10 years ago to make jokes about um, that you have to sleep your way to the top in Hollywood. That was perfectly acceptable 10 years ago. Well, culture's changed now. Oh, that's bad. Bible's going, yep, it's been bad for thousands of years. We can't expect to put our trust and reliance on a culture that's morality has no authority. So when we begin to look at these topics coming up, and I'm going to invite the worship team forward, our decision is that we're going to trust not only that the Lord has given his word to be our, our compass, but that we're going to trust that we, we need to have a, a clear direction on where to go with these things. Because people are lost, so they are going to try anything and everything in order to find that relief, to, in order to find that hope. So we're not doing this out of self-preservation. We're not doing this but, uh, just for the, for the heck of things. We're doing this to set people free, to prepare our children to be free and set others free, to embrace hope, to embrace courage, and to embrace truth. And this is where our church is designed where the church in general, the way God has designed it, to go and rescue people. Not to vilify them, not to hate them, not to throw them to the side, but to rescue them. And we're going to invite everyone to stand. And as we worship uh, during our first song, I want us to just take time to reflect. I want us to take time to, to press in, declare the truths that God has, has spoken over us, just even as we open his word today. Now the second song, I'm going to have a, a prayer team up here. If you need prayer, and we'll have the prayer buckets up here as well. But if you need to just come and be prayed over. Because I know the reality of what we said in the beginning, it's, it's hard to be torn between back and forth. I know Jesus, I want to follow Jesus this way, but everything in my flesh is telling me to go this way. And it's a struggle, it's a battle. But the power is when we trust the Lord with all these things, that he begins to, to lead and direct us in ways that we could have never imagined. Because after that, in Matthew 28, he tells us that we are to go into the world to transform culture, people, families, and communities with the good news that is the gospel of Jesus. So let's take that time to receive that gospel. Take that time to really encounter it. Because God wants us to, to display it.